Hey, it's Joe Crump. In this video, I'm going to show you how to wholesale real estate and discuss whether or not it makes sense for a beginner to start this way. So let's get started. What is wholesaling? Wholesaling, I call it assignable cash deals. Essentially, what you're doing is going out and finding a property for sale and then assigning your right to buy it to someone else. The trick with wholesaling, though, is it has to be a good deal. Remember, there are only two ways that real estate investors make money. Uh, one is that they buy properties substantially under market value for cash and uh, or assign those things for cash. Or two, they buy them on terms uh, at or below market value. So wholesaling is an assignable cash deal that you're buying uh, substantially under market value. You're raising the price a little bit, and then you're turning around and selling it typically to a real estate investor. Let's give you a, a, an example. Let's say I find a property that's worth $100,000, and I'm able to get it for $50,000 because the seller just doesn't want it anymore uh, and doesn't like it. Maybe it's not in great shape anyway. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'll put that uh, property under contract, uh, under a purchase agreement that is assignable, uh, and then I'll go out and find an investor who's interested in buying it. And maybe I'll add 5000 or maybe I'll add $10,000, depending on how much work that property needs. Uh, and I will then ask that uh, investor to come up with that $5,000 plus the $50,000 uh, that uh, will go to the seller to buy the property. And I'm assigning my right to buy that property for that amount of money uh, to that new buyer. And it could be an, an end user, somebody who lives there, or it could be an investor, depending on the condition of the property. Typically, you don't find end users uh, that are going to live in the property that uh, are able to buy these properties for cash. And most of the properties, many of the properties that you buy substantially under market value have repair issues, things that need to be done to them, which make it difficult for an end user to go out and get a loan. So typically, it's going to be a cash sale. And typically, uh, when somebody buys that property, they're going to close it in just a couple of weeks. So you'll go, you'll take that property to the title company uh, or open an escrow, and uh, they'll do a title search on it, make sure that it's free and, you know, free and clear or uh, will be free and clear once that $50,000 is paid off and that they can give a title insurance on it. And uh, then the buyer comes in with their $55,000. You get your $5,000 for assigning it. The $50,000 goes to the seller less a few uh, expenses, uh, like title insurance, uh, and then the deal is done. You've made money. You're out of the deal. The buyer uh, now owns that property, and they can go fix it up. Uh, maybe they put 10000 into it, 20000 into it. They turn around, sell it for $100,000. Uh, they make a profit after they pay for all the expenses uh, and do the work to make that happen. Eventually, you may want to get yourself into a position where you can do fix and flips like that yourself, and you'll stop doing assignments. If you do enough of these wholesale deals, you can build enough money to make that happen. And there's some other ways that you can buy property that doesn't require any money or, or capital as well, or credit. Uh, and those are things that I talk about in my other videos. Uh, most of the things that I do are zero down investments. Uh, and actually, it's not really zero. We don't actually... Uh, we don't come up with money when we buy, but we actually make money when we close a deal, uh, with, if you use the techniques that I'm teaching. So that's what wholesaling is. Now, how do you find a seller who's willing to do a wholesale deal? There's lots of ways to market for sellers. Uh, my favorite method is using a, a system that I created. It's called the Push Button Auto Marketer, uh, pushbuttonautomarketer.com. Uh, and that system goes to for sale by owners on Zillow, on Craigslist, uh, and it sends them a message. And it says, would you consider selling your home rent to buy rather than selling it outright? Uh, or you could send another message. I'm, in, I'm an investor and I buy properties under market value. Would you be interested in selling it to us? Now, the first one gets a lot more response than the second one, uh, but both of them work. Uh, and if you're only looking for properties under market value, you're going to get a lot fewer leads if you ask for, for properties that are under market value than if you sell, ask for properties that you can buy lease option. Um, but if you talk to people that say they might be interested in doing a lease option, you might still be able to get that property under market value or buy it on terms, so subject to or multi-mortgage or land contract or contract for deed or assignable uh, cash deals like we're talking about here. So there's lots of ways that you can buy these properties once you market 
market for them. What you need to do is learn how to be a deal engineer and then figure out which, which type of structure, which type of purchase makes the most sense for that seller. If you can solve the seller's problem, they're going to want to work with you. So you want to find the best solution for them that still makes you money. And having uh, the ability to structure the deal in multiple ways makes it possible for you to do that. If the only thing you're looking for is under market value properties and the only thing you're doing is wholesaling, that means you're going to leave a lot of deals on the table. I find that I can do 20 or 30 for rent method deals uh, for every wholesale deal that we do. And that's not because we can't do very many wholesale deals. We can if we choose to. But why leave all these other deals on the table? Why, why not go ahead and make money on all those? Because you're going to make just as much money doing a for rent method deal as you are doing a wholesale deal in most situations. So using the auto marketer is one great way to find these people. Uh, essentially what the auto marketer does is it goes to Craigslist, it goes to Zillow, it pulls the ads off of, the, off of those, it pulls their phone numbers, and then it sends a text message to them asking uh, if they'd be interested in doing that. And you can use a sequence of text messages to these people and over time uh, many of them will say yes I'm interested or maybe or tell me more about it uh, and even if they say no it starts a conversation uh, and so it makes it easier for them easier to call those people and work with them there's also a system in the auto marketer called the power dialer uh, so you can call all the people that said yes then you can call all the people that said no and then you can call all the people that didn't respond at all using this power dialer and it makes it possible for you to get through uh, a lot of these people uh, at the same you know one after the other after the other and, and call through them uh, individually uh, so many people spend so much time on the phone and the power dialer will speed up uh, that process by four to five hundred percent. A power dialer is similar to a predictive dialer if you've heard of that. It just works a little bit better for what we're trying to accomplish. Another way to find uh, people that will sell their properties dramatically under market value uh, is by sending them postcards or letters, uh, something along the lines of, I buy houses for cash. Uh, we can do a quick sale, we can do a quick cl closing, you know, call me, you know, I'm interested. It uh, doesn't matter what kind of condition it is, you know, those types of postcards. And in the Auto Marketer, we have a system set up so that you can upload leads to it. Uh, you can either ups upload absentee owner leads, you can upload leads that you drove around and wrote down their addresses, you can upload expired listing leads, you can use the leads from uh, Craigslist and Zillow, uh, any leads that you can pull off of there that have uh, addresses. Uh, and you can send uh, with just a couple of clicks of the button, you can pick a postcard, uh, and we've got multiple postcards, we've got yellow letter, we've got uh, self-mailers, uh, we've got a, you know, a, a couple of dozen different choices that you can use and send out the mail. And all you have to do is click a few buttons, put your credit card in, uh, pay for the postage, and then it sends that to a, a service that we use that sends out all the postcards for you, uh, and then you can wait for those responses. Now, those leads, are expensive uh, compared to the auto marketer where you're going to pay one to three to four dollars per lead on average uh, with uh, snail mail you're looking at twenty thirty forty dollars per lead uh, compared <laughs> compared to the auto marketer it's it's kind of a no-brainer uh, but it's still uh, there are some people that you're just not going to be able to get their phone numbers uh, so sending them snail mail is the only way to do it so if you have a good list of people you can send to it's a great way to get great leads because even if it costs you five hundred dollars to put a deal together and postage uh, and you make five thousand dollars on it you just made ten times the amount of money that you invested uh, in order to make that happen my suggestion though is if you're going to use snail mail for something like this that you know what you're doing uh, before you send it out and I think it's it's better to learn how to do this process using something like the auto marketer where the leads are so cheap and they don't cost you very much and you spend a few bucks on leads instead of uh, hundreds of dollars on, or thousands of dollars on leads learn with the easy leads learn with the low-hanging fruit and then you can move on and you'll be able to add absentee owners and expired listings to that mix afterwards and by the way, the auto marketer will also send voice blast to absentee owner and expired if you have their phone numbers. So you can also save a lot of money doing it that way. 
or you could do a combination where you send a snail mail and then you send a text and then you send a voice blast and you could do it in sequence over time and continue to drip on that particular lead. And if you know anything about direct mail marketing or direct marketing, which is internet marketing, it's snail mail marketing, uh, it's re direct response marketing. If you know anything about that, you know that typically they say that you need to touch them eight times uh, before you'll get a response. That isn't the case with the automarketer. We send out a blast and we'll get, you know, a 10 to 20 percent response rate on a pretty regular basis. I've had as high as 80 percent response rate to our text blasts that we've done. And I've had as low as 5 percent. Uh, so it kind of goes from the gamut. Uh, when I send out postcards, if I get one half of 1 percent uh, to respond, I'm, I feel like I'm doing fantastic. Uh, so you get so much less response with mail than you do with text. There are lots of other ways to find these types of leads as well. You can go around and look at vacant houses and track down their addresses and uh, do a skip trace on them and track down the seller uh, and, you know, see if you can offer them something. But uh, there is a level of work that's required to do in that kind of stuff uh, and time uh, that may be prohibitive after a while. And you may say, why not go after the easy stuff first? And then if we get that done, then I'll hire somebody to do this other work for me and we'll develop our leads in some other ways as well. There's some great uh, list uh, services that you can go to like um, uh, Melissa Data or List Source, where they'll sell you um, properties that are uh, absentee owners, people that don't live in the same property that they own. Uh, they're basically their address on their tax record where they live is different than the address of the property and those are considered absentee owners. And there's a lot of different ways to parse out those lists based on whether or not they have mortgages, what their prices are, what locations they are, and that'll help you find these types of properties. Uh, you can also get foreclosure lists uh, and uh, I find that people that are currently in foreclosure, and this is people that are, um, uh, they're called pre-foreclosure, people that are late on their payments and they've received a notice of default. So you can get lists of people that have notice of default and then you can go knock on their door, or send them postcards. But I find that most people that are in default don't have much equity. That's why they're in default because they couldn't sell it with a real estate agent. Uh, very few of them actually have a ton of equity in them. Some of them do, and sometimes you can find deals like that. I think if I were doing that, I would look at low-end properties. Uh, those are typically the ones that might be in default uh, that have uh, more equity in them. So once you have uh, a lead and you talk to them and they say, yes, I'll sell it to you at a certain price, then you got to put that property under contract and uh, uh, essentially make that contract assignable so that it's a regular purchase agreement that is assignable and cancelable by you. Uh, so you can always back out of the deal if you need to. And there's typically a time frame on it of, let's say, 90 days for you to be able to go out and find a buyer for that property. If you didn't price it right, if you didn't get the right price on it and then add the, you know, enough to make a profit for yourself and still keep it under market value so that whoever buys it from you can still make a profit, uh, then it won't sell. Uh, just straight up. Uh, and I see so many new investors who don't know how to price their properties. And it's not that they don't just know how to, they just don't know how to price their property. It's also that they don't know how to negotiate the deal to make that make sense. Now that's a topic for another video, but maybe uh, I can do that in the future where we talk about negotiation. I've got some other videos on my blog uh, at joecrumpblog.com that you can check out. And I also teach that in my uh, Push Button Auto Marketer, uh, also in my mentor program, uh, negotiation and talking to sellers and putting these deals together and getting them to accept the offers on terms or under market value is the most important thing that you can learn as a real estate investor. I've got other training programs on that, uh, but I think maybe the best one that I've got is my mentor program. I've got a six-month mentor program where I work personally with my students uh, for that, that time period and help them learn how to put these deals together so that people say yes. There is a, an art and a craft to it, uh, and if you learn it, uh, it'll serve you for the rest of your life. It's a little hard to learn at the beginning, but once you've learned it, you'll be able to, to put these deals together forever. Uh, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. All right, so now that you've uh, found the property, you found the, you, you put a, a contract together on it, now you need to go out and find a buyer for it. And you're going to find one of two buyers. You're either going to find an investor 
uh, who's going to buy that property, which is probably the most likely in most wholesale deals, or you're going to find uh, an end user, somebody who's going to live there. Uh, and that depends on the condition of the property. If the property is in terrible condition and needs a lot of money to fix it up, then it's unlikely that somebody's going to buy it to move into and fix it up. Happens sometimes. Sometimes contractors will buy and move into properties that are in rough condition. I've had that happen, uh, but it's it's unlikely that they'll ever get it fixed up, and it's unlikely uh, that they'll actually um, have enough cash to make it close. If you were selling it on terms, it'd be a lot easier. If you bought it on cash under market value, then you sold it on terms on a land contract or a lease option to somebody, and if it's in terrible condition on a land contract to somebody else, then uh, you know they could fix it up and they don't they wouldn't have to come up with as much money uh, to do that. So that's another option that you've got if you've got capital. But if you don't have capital, that's not something that you can do. So uh, finding Investors, though, uh, that's uh, not difficult. Uh, people get all bound up with, oh, I've got this investor, and he wants to buy this property, and here's the criteria that he wants, and I just got to go out and find a property for him. No, you don't need to do that. What you need to do is just go out and find a good deal, because as soon as you find a good deal, the investors are going to be knocking down your door wanting to buy it from you. A good deal is a good deal, and good deals aren't that easy to find, especially dramatically under market value deals. Uh, so when you come up with one, you're going to be able to, and the, the one that's going to actually make them a profit, uh, it's going to work for you. Now, keep in mind, there's a few things that have to happen for them to make a profit. They have to pay for the underlying house. They have to pay for your assignment fee. They have to pay for the rehab on the house. They have to pay for holding costs, and they have to pay for selling costs. Uh, people aren't, and, and make sure you build in realtor fees into their selling costs, because if uh, the rehabber is turning around to sell their property, the likelihood that they're going to sell it themselves as a for sale by owner is very, very low. 85 to 95 percent of them don't succeed. So most rehabbers just go directly to the MLS and try to sell it that way. So figure out 10 or 12 percent just for, for uh, selling costs. So, and then, of course, you've got to pay for utilities. You've got to pay for, uh, you know, the, the lawn and all the other aspects of owning a home, taxes, all those things while you're holding it. So if you're holding it for, you know, multiple months, uh, make sure that you build that cost into it uh, for your investor. And then look at that deal and say, is there enough profit after doing all this work? Is there enough profit on their investment? And if they have a cash investment, uh, you know, of X amount of dollars uh, and they make X amount of dollars, then you can figure out what their return on investment is simply be, by dividing that into it. And that'll give you a percentage of return over a certain period of time that you can guesstimate. And if that makes sense, for an investor, then you're going to get it sold. If it doesn't make sense for an investor, then you'll never sell that property and you're just wasting your time. So once that's done, now you have to uh, go and get it closed. So you take that document, uh, you take that buyer to the title company, you say, here's the deal, this is what we're going to do, we're going to close it. Uh, how, you know, and you ask the title company, what's the best way to pay me? You know, what's the best way for me to get paid in this deal? Do you want me do you want to pay me out of the seller proceeds uh, so that the, the, the buyer pays the full amount plus your assignment fee uh, and, and then uh, comes out of the seller proceeds? Uh, do you want the buyer to pay me uh, separately before we come here? Just ask the title company and they'll have an attorney there and they'll tell you the right way to do it because it's going to be different for different people in different locations. But it's not difficult to do. So the next big question that comes up is how much do wholesalers actually make when they sell a property? And it all depends on the value of the property and how much under market value you get it. If you buy a property for $20,000, for example, let's say you get a property for $20,000 uh, under contract and that property is worth $100,000, that means you got $80,000 of equity in that property. Let's say it needs $20,000 of work. That means you've got it up to $40,000 is going to be their investment. Uh, plus their closing costs of, let's say, another 10%. So that brings it up to $50,000. That means there's $50,000 of equity. How much of that $50,000 of equity can you get out of that new buyer and still have it make sense for them to do this deal? In this situation, you could probably get $25,000, and they'd probably be happy with $25,000 of profit out of a deal like that. So that would be a pretty sweet deal for you. But you're also buying it pretty dramatically. You're buying it for 20% of its value, uh, which is a difficult thing to pull off. 
Now, if you're closer to 50%, let's say you're at, at uh, $50,000 on this, and it's going to cost $20,000 to fix it up. Uh, so now you're at $70,000 plus another 10 to, to sell it and hold it. So now you're at $80,000. That means there's $20,000 uh, left in there for you and the investor to uh, divide. So you have to figure out how much will the, how much, uh, will the, the investor require before they'll even do this. So if you took 5000 out of this uh, and they get fifteen, is that enough for the money that they have to come up with in order to do this? They've got seventy, you know, five thousand dollars into this property, and they're only making fifteen thousand dollars on it. If they can do that in a couple of months, if they can do a quick flip, that's one thing. If it's going to take them a year to do it, then that's something else entirely. So you want to figure out what their return on investment per year is, and whether or not something like that's going to make sense. Also, if it's unpredictable about what kind of condition the property is in, uh, and it's, it's always somewhat unpredictable. There, we've, we've found all kinds of things <laughs> in properties uh, after, we, uh, after we bought them. Uh, and we'd, we'd come in and find out, oh, no, the floor joists are all in bad shape and they have to be replaced. So now we just added another four or $5,000 uh, to, uh, uh, to the cost of the property, which we didn't anticipate because we didn't see them because they were under the carpet, which was under the floorboards. So uh, those types of things happen to investors. That's why they want to make sure they've got enough cushion in their deal to make sure that they make a profit. So they have an a ideal profit that they're going to make, and then they've got, okay, here's the contingency profit. And then, of course, if they do it badly, which I've done, you know, not too recently, or actually more, more recently than I'd like to admit, uh, when, you, when you don't judge it properly, uh, then you end up not making any money at all or, God forbid, actually losing money, which I see an awful lot of rehabbers uh, doing. The beauty of making money like this, though, is you have no liability. You don't have any money into these deals. You haven't used your credit. All you've done is gotten a piece of paper that says you have the right to buy this property at a certain price, and then you've gone out and advertised it on Craigslist or Zillow uh, or to your investor list, which you will start building when you start selling these kinds of properties. You're going to build an investor list. And the auto marketer, by the way, is <laughs> a little plug here, is, is uh, a great way to build that list. Uh, there's some uh, ways to find investors uh, with the auto marketer, and uh, then you can also keep them in there, and you can broadcast out to them whenever you get a new property. And when you have a decent size investor list, you'll be able to sell your properties very quickly, sometimes in a day, simply by sending out an email saying, hey, I've got a new property. Here's the deal on it. You'll get five people to call you on it, and you'll take the one that you want. Uh, this is so much different than having one guy who has to look at each one of your properties and say, eh, I, I don't really like that one, get me another one. And then you have to go out and start all over again and do it with another guy. Put together good deals and you'll have lots of investors who are interested in your deals and you'll be able to sell them very quickly uh, and make a lot of money doing it. Is wholesaling uh, a good plan for a beginner? I think it's a great plan for a beginner because it doesn't require money. It doesn't require uh, credit. Uh, you don't have to go out and get a loan. You don't have to qualify for anything. All you have to do is, like I said before, get that document signed. So it's really nice for beginners. Beginners. The big problem I see with wholesaling is uh, the how sparse the number of deals are compared to other types of deals. If you go out there and do flip lease options using the Ferret method uh, that I teach my mentor students, uh, you're going to have a lot lot more properties that you can work with. A lot more people are willing to take full price for their property than are willing to take 50% of the value on a property. So if you're a beginner, my suggestion is start with the Ferrant method uh, and then migrate uh, into these other deals as they start to come across your desk. Because as you're going after the for sale by owner, or, or as you're going after the lease option deals, uh, you're going to naturally come across uh, these wholesale deals. People say, I don't want to do a lease option, but I will sell it for, you know, under market value. And those are deals that you can turn into, uh, you can turn into wholesale deals. And eventually, when you start creating capital like this, you're going to be able to purchase those properties with cash. Uh, because you'll be made money from your other deals. Can you find wholesale deals with real estate agents? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, you, you can have real estate agents that give you pocket listings. Maybe they come up with something every once in a while that they find or that they don't want to list because it's in such terrible condition. Sometimes agents will give you that information. And I know that there are people out there that go around and, and develop relationships with agents to be able to do that. But honestly, I think it's a waste of time. There's lots of other ways to find great deals. You don't have to go through real estate agents and then pay them a fee to do that. 
uh, unless you just start naturally developing those relationships over time uh, as you're doing this other stuff. You know, great if they bring you one, but I wouldn't make it your main goal. Uh, if you look at why they can't find these types of properties for you, they could go and they could make an offer on every house in the MLS and just do lowball offers on them. Uh, sometimes they work. <laughs> 99.9% .9 of the time they don't work and they just make the other agents angry at them. So agents don't do that for very long. Uh, there's also looking for properties that are uh, REOs, real estate owned. These are properties that have been taken back uh, by the bank and now they've put them on the market typically with a real estate agent. And that real estate agent is attempting to get the maximum amount of money they can for that property. Uh, and, but sometimes you can get some good deals because they're not in great shape and you could go in and fix them up and do it that way. But you'd have to buy them for cash. And you might be able to bird dog them for another investor and they give you a couple thousand bucks to find those properties for you. Um, but then you'd have to find an investor and you'd have to make sure that they're going to follow through with it. And you're not going to be able to go out to your list and sell them to those people. I think that's a, a mistake to go in that direction. Instead, go after the seller directly. Go after sellers directly and find the great deals uh, and then take those great deals and build your, your buyer's list, your investor's list and sell those properties to that investor list and you'll take the profit yourself and you'll have more properties that you can work with without having to go big into uh, an, an agent or uh, you know someone else in this transaction. Real estate agents can be wholesalers as well. Uh, essentially uh, real estate agents do something very similar to wholesaling. They're getting a commission instead of a profit. Uh, as, a, as an investor, we make profits. As, a, as an agent, you make a commission. Uh, and you could, if you're buying especially cheap properties, you could raise your commission on those types of things and be able to get a little bit more money and then turn around and sell them to investors. Uh, those investors could fix them up and then you could then turn around again and sell uh, the properties for them through the MLS and make a, a double commission on a property like that. I've known a lot of investors that have done it like that or a lot of agents that have done it like that. Uh, I used to be a real estate agent way back when. Uh, I've, been, I've had a broker's license for 30 years. I still do. Uh, but we would do something similar to that where we would work almost exclusively uh, with investors because investors have cash. They can close immediately. You don't have to worry about inspections. You don't have to worry about appraisals. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You just close the deal and it usually takes two weeks and you got your money and then they're off fixing up the property and as soon as they get it fixed, they're calling you again to list the property and you sell it for them and flip it and then you go help them find another property. It's a great way to uh, create a, a good business for a real estate agent. One of the things I, I love about wholesaling is that it requires no cash, no credit, uh, no verifiable income. All you need is a piece of paper that says, I have the right to buy this property at this price within this period of time uh, from this person and it's assignable to someone else. And then you need an assignment form that says, I'm assigning this uh, agreement to you, uh, and then you give it to them, and they sign everything, uh, and then you go to, to closing and you get your money. This isn't zero down real estate investing. This is cash at closing real estate investing. Who pays closing costs in a wholesale deal? Uh, typically, closing costs are split between the seller and the buyer. You don't pay any closing costs. The seller pays uh, half of the closing cost of the property. The, the buyer pays any financing costs they've got. They pay for uh, an owner policy if they decide to get a, a, a title insurance policy on their end as well. The seller also pays for a seller's title policy. Uh, it typically would cost, uh, you know, on a $100,000 property or so, maybe $1,000 to close the property deal, so maybe half of it and half of it uh, on average. Now it's going to be a little different depending on uh, the title company you use. It's also going to be different depending on the purchase price because the purchase, uh, the, the title insurance goes up based upon uh, the purchase price. So what are the common mistakes that wholesalers make? I think the most common one and the biggest problem that you're going to have and it's not going to cost you any money because wholesaling doesn't cost any money. So if you screw it up, the only thing it costs is your time. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about these problems uh, other than the fact that you're just going to irritate everybody <laughs> around you if you do this. Uh, and, and that problem is not getting a properly priced property, a property that can actually be sold. You know, there's one of the things I tell my mentor students is uh, use these words. 
here is how I work. There are certain things that you can do and certain things you can't do. If a seller or a buyer tells you, well, I'd like you to do this, or I'd like you to do that, or, or you know, would you give me $20,000 for this, or would you do this, or do that, or would you do this inspection, or not put a sign in the yard, or all these other different things that they may want you to do that you know that you have to do in order to sell that property. You just say, well, this is how I work. You know, I, I could do it your, your way, but it won't work that way. So here's how I do it. And then explain the way that you do it that makes sense that's going to work. And that's what you're going to have to do in a wholesale deal. You're going to have to talk to these sellers and make them understand that it doesn't sell if we don't get the price in the place where it should be. Nobody's going to pay more than a property is worth. And a property has to be discounted if it's in bad condition. And that's what most wholesaler deals are going to be about. The other trap that I see uh, wholesalers fall into is not being honest about the value. They'll come in here and they'll say, oh, this property is worth X amount of dollars, way above what it's really worth. Uh, and you can make this much money on it. And they'll try to sell it to some, uh, you know, unsuspecting investor who comes up with some money and buys the property. And sometimes that works, but most of the time it doesn't because this is people, these are people with cash that are buying these properties and they wouldn't have that cash <laughs> if it's that easy to separate uh, from them unless they borrowed it from a friend or whatever and sometimes that happens too. I've seen people getting taken advantage of uh, plenty of times in these situations but don't you be the investor that screws other people. You know, Be the most ethical person in the room. Be the one who makes it work out for everybody because you're going to build a reputation in the town that you're working in and and uh, nobody's going to work with you and you're going to have a, if you, if you treat people badly or you lie to them or you cheat them, uh, they're not going to work with you for long and your business will not be sustainable and you won't be able to sleep at night. You know, make sure you have a business that you can be proud of and that your kids can be proud of. The other thing I see wholesalers fall into is uh, the idea that they're going to make a lot of money without really doing any work. Uh, you know, there's not much risk in doing this, but you got to put the effort in. And you got to develop the skills. Uh, one of the things that I spend the most time with with my students is teaching them how to talk. And if you don't learn how to put a deal together and you don't put the time in to learn how to do it, you'll never actually uh, succeed in what you're trying to accomplish. So be patient with yourself. Go through the process and learn how it works. Negotiation is one of the most important things that you can learn in this process. So learn how to negotiate. Learn how to talk to these sellers. Read every book you can, you can get on it. Uh, there's some really good ones out there that'll help you go through that process. Uh, and if you want my personal help, again, the mentor program, I can walk you through that. By the way, here's the link to my mentor program where I actually work with people over a six-month period and teach them how to do and build their own business so that they can replace their income and do this full-time and then start building a portfolio. Uh, the portfolio is what actually builds your wealth. Flipping properties is great, makes you cash, you can live on it, uh, you can start buying other properties, but when you actually buy properties that you keep for the long term, that's what's gonna make you wealthy. So that's about it. Just to wrap it up, uh, wholesaling is great, doesn't require your money, doesn't require uh, any credit, uh, does require some time and some skill to learn how to do it. It requires the ability uh, to go out and find leads that are willing to do this. Uh, and I, I also want you to remember that this isn't uh, a method that should be your only method. Learn the other zero down structures. I have a whole hierarchy of zero down structures subject to multi-mortgage, land contract or contract for deed, assignable cash deals, which is wholesaling, and then lease options. And that's the hierarchy of control in the zero down structures. You always want to buy the high, at the higher end of it, and you always want to sell at the lower end of it. Wholesaling can make you a lot of money, but it should be only a part of your entire strategy as a real estate investor. All right. I hope you enjoy the materials. Uh, if you haven't uh, done so before, make sure you subscribe. Uh, you can also subscribe with this little circle button, and then you can see the next video right here.